Thank you very much, Francisca, for organizing this conference and thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'll, I'll do a presentation and my, I, I think it'll be around 45 to minutes to maximum one hour so that we have uh, time for a uh, discussion afterwards. So now you know how much time you sort of, what kind of time frame that you should be prepared for. Uh, and uh, so I'll try to give my perspective on the, uh, one possible perspective on the topic of this conference. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Please come in and take a seat. Ah, yeah, one more thing. Uh, I'm, I'm planning to not use the microphone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. And if you cannot hear me during the presentation, please interrupt me, okay? So, uh, because I don't want you to sit there, oh, I couldn't, couldn't hear anything. Please interrupt me if you can't hear. As soon as a body enters the stage, images, social structures and ideas are immediately attached to this materiality. Actually, a body does not even have to enter the stage for this to happen. Processes of signification are already there, whether I want to or not. The hand balancing body is already traversed by systems of signification that are inherent to the technique or have become part of it? Which are these systems of signification that have become part of the body through practice? How do they become inscribed in the materiality of the body? And which space is there for the artist 
to navigate within this process. According to the philosophers Deleuze and Guattari and their analysis of the possibility of a body without organs, the three main structures of signification that, tra that traverse and structure human existence are the organism, signification, and the subject. According to this idea, the organism is not a pre-given reality, but a certain ideological idea of how bodies are delimited, organized, and structured. In a similar way, the subject is a culturally specific idea related to profound relations of power and functions as a way to make a subject readable in society. Also, structures of sense-making belong to these normative structures through which we become understandable as meaningful bodily selves. In this presentation, I would like to test the hypothesis that these three layers of the organism, signification, and the subject are particularly intermingled in circus, as the circus disciplines modulates all three within the same practice. I would like to explore how processes of signification traverse the circus body materially, discursively, subjectively, within one circus discipline, namely hand balancing. Furthermore, I'd like to discuss which forms of agency the circus performer has in these processes. In which way is the circus body already being articulated before I even make any choice within that? And in which way is the circus body articulating itself? In order to understand this, I propose that we need to look at circus and each circus discipline not only as performance but as practice and as the possible rearticulation of the structures we are part of depend on individual appropriations and manipulations, I will allow myself to discuss how I have dealt with, with these questions within my own practice. Furthermore, I'll not delimit myself to a strictly Deleuzean framework. Rather, I'll take the three levels of the organism, signification and the subject as a starting point only to then go into more detail through other concepts and perspectives. In order to understand these processes in hand balancing, I believe I need to take liberties in manipulating this theoretical material according to my needs, rather than letting the theoretical material decide my focus and directions. An important question and concern within this work is thus how to articulate the rather mute practice of hand balancing within these powerful, strong philosophies and the discursive powers they are given within today's landscapes of research. Uh, please come in and take a seat. <laughs> 
at a first glance, it may seem as if the practice of hand balancing breaks with the typical image of the organism as an upright human body. But if we look more closely, it seems as if hand balancing, in a certain way, takes the idea of the organism to the extreme. Not only does the aesthetic of hand balancing rely on organic qualities such as a display of strength, symmetry and flexibility. Also, within the very principles of the technique, we can detect characteristics that are present within the ideology of the organism. For instance, anatomical analysis, physiological functionality and functional efficiency. Within the organism, each body part must be discerned and distinguished, have a determinable function and function efficiently. Hand balancing may inverse certain functions, but while doing so, it demands an even more elaborate analysis and efficiency. The technique of hand balancing relies on an extreme analysis of each body part and the way in which it is related to other body parts through joints. This analysis is, is expressed in the practice, for instance, through the necessity of isolating and dissociating each body part. The technique depends on the capacity to not let the position of the shoulders be influenced by the movement of the torso, hips or legs. Another example of this dissociation is the necessity of distinguishing between the tilt of the pelvis needed to flatten the back and the movement of the legs. So you need to dissociate the hip and the leg parts, so to speak. Also, in terms of functionality, hand balancing actually requires an even more extreme organism. As the structure of the body has developed through humans' tendencies to stand on their legs, the distribution of weight is much more difficult to control when the body is inverted. The surface on which the weight is distributed is much smaller. smaller. The shoulder joints are much less stable than the hips and the center uh, of balance is placed much higher compared to the ground. Um, so what all this means that when you stand on your hands, it's way more difficult to control the body weight because your center of gravity is much higher and you're standing on such a small surface and with a joint balancing through a joint which is very unstable. Um, so, thus, hand balancing relies on an even more detailed and perfected organism capable of balancing within a biomechanically more difficult position. This demands not only a strong and flexible body, but even a neurologically specific one. In his work on the use of handstand in capoeira, Greg Downey shows how our neurological systems of balancing are both ecological, meaning that they are relying on the interaction between many senses at once, and plastic and changeable. Through practice, he claims, even our most profound bodily functions, such as our sense of balance, actually becomes enculturated, influenced by the body images and cultural practices that we are part of. Thus, this extreme organism is slowly anchored within the materiality of the body, including the nervous system. So, hand balancing, you could say, relies on an even more uh, detailed and perfected organism. But we need to, need to understand the double nature, a double movement of this process. It both anchors the normative organism within the body, and it renders a minute articulation of this organism possible at the same time. Due to the enhanced capacity of sensing nuances in postural balance, the hand balancer also slowly becomes capable of manipulating this organism and its demands. The question, therefore, um, does not only become whether the organism is entering the body or not, and whether it limits the body or not, but what this particular body renders sensible or not sensible. Within my own practice, this is what I'm most interested in at the moment. Which kinds of sensation does hand balancing render possible? In which way does this technique enable sensation 
sensation of the nuances of postural balance in ways that are not otherwise possible. In my own practice, I therefore tend to think about hand balancing as a somatic circus. As a circus, dis or as a circus discipline, the focus of hand balancing is often on performance and maybe even the performance of tricks, which you could say are another version of the extreme organism. But as a practice, it allows a minute work on the sensorial systems of the body, thus becoming a site for experimentation with the organism. In fact, though hand balancing differs in many ways from the practices that we can tend to call somatic, I think this practice has some inherent characteristics which could qualify it as a somatic practice as well. The first characteristic, uh, I would say, is the one of continuity and repetition. So hand balancing, as many other circus disciplines, requires constant repetition of quite few movement as it basically consists of an intense training of the nervous system. Therefore, it allows to develop an understanding of the endless nuances and differences of sensation within one and the same figure. So just one and the same figure. Even if you're basically doing the same thing, so a handstand or standing on your hands, the same sensation never returns, but varies depending on the time of the day, the temperature, the degree of flexibility, and so forth. Rather than installing one skill to be repeated, balancing requires a constant search for the sensation of balance. Here the analytical aspect of hand balancing, which may be understood as part of the ideology of the organism, also becomes part of the constant search for the sensation of balance. The technique of hand balancing constantly asks the hand balancer to distinguish yet more fine degrees in the angles of articulations of the joints, ways of distinguishing paradoxical and contradictory movements, and thus enter into yet more details of sensation. The very same characteristics which may anchor the organism in the materiality of the body here become part of a search for yet more nuances of that materiality. But hand balancing as a somatic circus is not only about what you feel, but also about what you cannot feel yet. At any moment of learning hand balancing, there are things that one curiously cannot feel. One leg that is held higher than the other, one uh, body part which is tilting or the body is twisting slightly. I tend to think about this as the gap of sensation in hand balancing a gap that is constantly displaced. Thus, hand balancing is working on the limit between what can be felt and what cannot be felt or cannot be felt yet. It is pushing the boundaries of my own understanding of this materiality called my body, this organism that I'm part of. <laughs> 
Though hand balancing is a rather mute practice, it is not devoid of verbal articulation, and it is part of multiple discourses um, that, will, that discourse through which hand balancing is taught, discourses on the circus, and so forth. Actually, when it comes to hand balancing, I would prefer to not distinguish between discourse as linguistic structures and discourse as institutional practices. Hand balancing is in itself, through its practice, a discourse, and thus, through that very practice, I'm inscribed in a specific discourse. However, for the sake of simplicity, let me here focus a little on the use of verbal discourse in hand balancing and the way in which this may possibly be part of the intermingled constructions of the organism, signification and the subject. The use of language in practice is a way of making distinctions and through those distinctions making it possible for us to sense distinctions. In a certain sense we become capable of sensing what language is asking us to sense and in that way discourse is part of the enculturation of our material bodies including our sensorial systems. So the question for me becomes, what does our discourse enable us to sense and how does that shape the organism and the subject? Let me give an example. Within a project conducted this autumn, I asked hand balancing students what they were actually sensing in different hand balancing situations. The answers I got were mostly formulated in terms of it was a good handstand or it was a bad handstand. So, instead of talking about what they sensed, they tended to talk about the success of the handstand. There seems to be something in the circus context which asks them to understand their own practice in terms of success and failure, rather than in terms of sensation. I think this is particularly problematic in a discipline such as hand balancing, which relies on slow transformations of the practitioner's ecological sense of balancing. In a certain way, hand balancing in this is an invisible art of the sense of balance, processes that we hardly see and almost cannot sense. However, if these hand balancing students had acquired their way of talking through a current discourse within circus, then the focus seems to be elsewhere. I would dare make the statement that this discourse of success and failure, of performance and perfection, does not really help the hand balancer develop more new and sensations of balancing. It reveals that we tend to understand ourselves, become readable as subjects, as hand balancers, when we perform to perfection. So the question for me becomes, how can we develop forms of discourse, or way of, ways of articulating ourselves within discourse, that support our work within the practice? Of course, we can never escape the discourses we're part of, whether they're embedded in practice or in verbal and written communication. But what I believe is important is to create space for critical articulation within a specific practice or discourse. So how can we possibly do that within hand balancing? First of all, I think it might be important to show that hand balancing is not a mute practice that it is capable of articulating itself, yet without giving priority to verbal and written articulation. Perhaps we can imagine articulation as a concept that can grasp, grasp the way hand balancing articulates itself within discourse in a way that traverses material and immaterial layers. In order to define what she means by articulation, uh, a German researcher called uh, Peter Sabisch, uh, writing about choreography, returns to the idea of how a joint articulates. And from there describes how articulation occurs when heterogeneous elements, so different elements, are joined and distinguished through a relation. So you have two different body parts connected through a joint, so these are heter heter heterogeneous, so they are different, they cannot be combined, but they are yet combined through something which binds them together and yet separates them, so the elbow in this case. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so, 
So this double movement of connecting and differentiating at the same time is thus characteristic of articulation as a process. And this, according to Sabish, includes, and I quote, a qualitative transformation of the parts in their mutual relation to each other, end of quote. On a material level, such a qualitative articulation and transformation seems to be at stake in hand balancing. This is yet another way to understand the analytical aspect of hand balancing and how the hand balancer needs to both connect body parts across an alignment that involves the whole body and yet differentiate minutely between different angles and body parts. But how do we create techniques of articulation that would allow hand balancers to articulate their practice not only within the practice itself, but also in other media and discourses, yet without losing track of practice? Again, I do not think that, that there is one given answer to that question. But with me, my own practice, I try to find tools for how to bring hand balancing into contact with other forms of articulation in other discourses in order to allow for possible re-articulation of the practice. How to do that is not an easy task. First of all, it is not easy to articulate the specific characteristics and nuances of hand balancing as it is sensed and experienced. Secondly, there's always an overhanging risk that the practice of hand balancing is overruled by the concepts and metaphors of other practices for instance, the practice of academic analysis through strong philosophical concepts. In fact, this has been one of my main concerns when working with this particular presentation. While trying to detect and analyze the layers of signification that become materialized in the circus body, how can I be sure that I'm not imposing yet other significations? Of course, I cannot be sure that I am not, or rather, of course, I am always inscribing yet other layers. But again, the question is not if this happens, but if it simultaneously allows for re-articulation. Therefore, there are two tools that I try to keep active in my work. One is the grasping of the concreteness of hand balancing, and the other is connecting hand balancing to someone, something else. Through constantly trying to keep grasp of the concreteness of hand balancing, I'm struggling to articulate hand balancing from practice. I imagine that if I stay sufficiently in touch with this concreteness, that there, there is a chance that my concepts and tools do not take over, do not rule the argumentation. On the other hand, I need to connect hand balancing to something outside of practice or the practice of hand balancing itself in order to allow a re-articulation to happen. This may end up challenging the practice itself, but if we are to use verbal or written articulation as a method to critically articulate or re-articulate the discourses at work within hand balancing, then that is a risk we need to take. It may stretch that practice significantly, but personally I believe that that is a healthy exercise. So just as an example of this uh, struggle uh, with other discourses, I. I had to rewrite this presentation about 12 times to make sure that I did not sort of get on a high, like theoretical highway. You know, you choose the theoretical angle and then you've got all your answers. But how to actually anchor the argument uh, within the concreteness of the work. Um, so. So, to the concept of subject. The concept of subject is probably one of the most contested ones. So here I'll not go into detail with the complexities of what we might mean by subject. We can discuss that later. But I'd like to ask, are there any specific structures of subjectivity 
that are imposed upon us through the practice of hand balancing. But curiously enough, at least in my experience, the technique of hand balancing does not really seem to elaborate with any specific idea about the subject. At least within the discourse or the uh, use of language within hand balancing training, or most of those kind of trainings that I have encountered at least, no particular effort seems to be directed towards processes of subjectivity. What makes a subject understandable is the very action of hand balancing, the performance of handstands, preferably to perfection. That is which make what makes the subject readable as a hand balancing subject. This is actually a good example of how intermingled the structures of the organism, signification and the subject are in circus and in hand balancing. It is as if there is no specific understanding of the subject outside of the performance of the organism, at least not one that is explicitly dealt with within the discourse of the practice itself. But rather than seeing this as a hindrance, we could see this as a certain liberty. If the practice itself does not interfere with the subject's understanding of itself beyond the practice of hand balancing, then it leaves the individual to articulate her own understanding uh, of herself as a hand balancing subject. Within my own practice, this level has actually become more and more important. Just as I've just as I have come to understand hand balancing as a somatic circus, a way of experimenting uh, with, um, with the articulation of sensation, I also see it as a specific way of practicing subjectivity. Or to use Michel Foucault's term, I see it as a technique of the self. To put it shortly, in Foucault's earlier work, he proposes to see the subject as a product of specific technologies of power that render the subject visible, readable, and analyzable to society. However, in his later work, he returns to this idea looking not only at the technologies of power, but uh, looking at the historically specific um, practices of the self or, t or techniques of the self. And he proposes that each society and period has these uh, techniques of the self through which subjectivity is uh, activated. Um, so subjectivity is still culturally constructed, but through the activity and sometimes deliberate effort of the individual. And according to Foucault, certain practices of the self or techniques of the self seem to give more space for others, for the individual to critically engage with its um, own conditions and the world around it. Thus, when we look at something, the question is not only whether it possibly constitutes a technique of the self or not, but which space this technique gives for critical reflection. According to Amy Allen's reading of Foucault, this possible space of critical agency of the individual can be understood as two things. One, as the capacity for autonomy, including, and I quote, the capacities to reflect critically upon the power knowledge relations that have constituted one's subjectivity, end of quote. And that's the possibility, and I quote again, to engage in practices of self-transformation, end of quote. But how can hand balancing, um, but can hand balancing really be understood as a technique of the self? And does it, in, in that case, allow for critical self-transformation? <laughs> 
I think there are several characteristics of hand balancing that potentially makes of it a technique of the self, even if this may seem to be at odds with the use as a performance practice. But to describe this, I need to connect hand balancing to yet, another con to yet other concepts with the risk of mi mixing theoretically, theoretical perspectives in a non-dogmatic way. For actually, I believe that in order to understand hand balancing's way of practicing the subject, we need uh, to look at something much smaller than the powerful rules through which we become readable in society. We need to look at the way hand balancing practices embodied subjectivity. On a very concrete level, I need to ask myself, how do I perceive myself as a subject the moment I'm balancing on my hands? What goes through my mind the moment I have all my weight on my hands? According to my experience, the subjectivity experienced at this moment is a subjectivity stripped down to a minimum. No time for biographical narratives, psychological reasoning or the like. Just one sensation in many variations. This is me upside down. In a certain sense, it reminds me of what the filmological researcher Dan Sahavi has called the minimal self. According to Sahavi, the minimal self is the very sensation that my consciousness pertains to me and not to someone else. The experience that my thoughts are mine and not yours. I think there's something in the practice of hand balancing which brings us back to this minimal self. In the moment of balancing on your hands, consciousness is brought back to the, one of the most basic sensations of the self. This is my conscious experience of my body being upside down. Very experienced hand balancers may have the capacity to think about other things, such as shopping and to-do lists and so on, uh, when balancing on their hands. But in the figures um, that, add, that are at the limit of your capacity, and they demand full concentration. And this uh, minimal subject is what we are then brought back to. It's a hypothesis of mine, at least. Um. However, already the moment we begin to thematically address this experience, something else is happening. We are reflecting upon the experience of sensing ourselves as subject. So even in the most minimal experience of the self, there's already a dynamic relation between the experience of the self and the reflection upon the experience of sensing oneself as a self. Even in the most concentrated hand balancing position, there is already the beginning of such a doubleness. The experience that this is me and not someone else being upside down, but also reflecting upon this experience as if I take myself as an object. Maybe it is in this split that we find the first possibility for self-reflection or re-articulation of the self within a practice. Thus, we can perhaps see hand balancing as a technique of the self in the sense that it allows us to experience and reflect upon subjectivity at a quite basic, minimal level, the one that distinguishes my experience of me from your experience of you. Hand balancing is a way of practicing this minimal subjectivity. This is not to say that hand balancing practices subjectivity outside of societal power structures. Hand balancing is still a culturally and historically specific technique of the self, which makes certain things possible and others not. But with some effort, it, it can become a site to critically reflect upon this and how to practice our subjectivities within the structures that we are part of. <laughs> 
So as you can see, I'm coming to my conclusion. Yeah. As a medium of circus is, to a large extent, the very materiality of the individual body, the material and immaterial structures inscribed in this body become a strong part of, sig of signification that occurs in circus performance. Therefore, we cannot see circus, the circus body as a neutral material through which aesthetic signification is communicated in performance. We need to understand how different layers of signification are already materialized through practice and which space the circus artist may have for re-articulating herself within those structures. For instance, if circus through its methodology, or sorry, if circus through its mythology, the certain myth that circus tends to create of itself, seems to escape certain normative structures, it does indeed participating in materializing certain ideologies of the organism, signification, and the subject. Yet, rather than seeing this as something only to escape from, we need to see it in a nuanced way. These structures also make certain things possible. This elaboration of the organism that it creates also allows certain forms of sensation. The question is not how to avoid these structures altogether, but how to create space for critical autonomy and self-transformation within the structures of the practice. Or as de la Sanguetterie would have said, how to install yourself of one of these strata and experiment with it. Or as I would add, how to create possibilities of articulation and rearticulation, both within the materiality of the practice and in the meeting with other media and discourses. In my own practice, I have struggled with this in several ways, in order to come to terms with the expectation imposed through circus hand balancing. I have ended up almost removing hand balancing from the field of circus. I have made of it, in my own practice, a somatic circus, often practiced solitarily, uh, focusing on hand balancing as a way of exploring sensation rather than as a way of performing. And I also tend to think of it as a technique of the self, a way of sensing and practicing subjectivity, and a space for reflection upon the structures that I am part of, whether it is as a circus artist or as a researcher. And here I'd like to add that uh, actually the creation of this, uh, or the sort of formulation of this somatic uh, circus as a technique of the self is just as much a, a sort of reaction to the structures imposed on us through research. So it's not only, if it sounds critical towards circus, actually it's even more critical towards the structures of academia. Um, but we can take that discussion later. Hmm? Yeah, so um, the question is not whether circus imposes structures of signification, such as the organism, semiotic meaning, and subjectivity upon the circus body, but to which extent it gives space for critical rearticulation within these structures. I do not know if I succeed, and I do not think that this is the only way of creating space for critical rearticulation of circus hand balancing. But I do think that if we want circus to be a vital field of expression, we need to make space for different kinds of rearticulation, even if we may sometimes end up taking a practice to its limits. Thank you. <laughs>